And there we are. Um, thank you very much, Nerds and Wiley, for keeping us all alive scientifically. It's really been great to have this series. And uh, thanks, Kirsty, for that you know really beautiful talk. I want to switch gears a little bit, though, talk about something a little bit different. Um, you know, I think for those of us in this room, this is not a controversial proposition, right? This is something we all believe. Yes, of course, but for our fellow citizens out there, it's not so obvious. And whenever we have examples, we should be uh, put them in our pocket for, for future use. So is basic research important? Well, uh, if you want to make a vaccine, you need to uh, take the protein from your virus and inject it into the subject and that trains up the immune system and everything's great, except it's been known for some time that that's of limited value on coronaviruses because you take coronaviruses and you put them, you divorce them from the rest of the viral particle, put them in a subject and many of them adopt the wrong conformation. Okay, that's what you're seeing the things surrounded by the red boundary on the left there. Uh, these are spike proteins from coronaviruses and they're two obvious classes of confirmations. One of them is the prefusion confirmation that uh, the patient will see if, they ever, if the real thing ever comes along. And the other is something irrelevant. And you train up the immune system for something irrelevant and then you don't get as good a vaccine. So clearly it would be good to engineer a modified spike protein that stabilizes the native confirmation, the prefusion confirmation. But how are you gonna do that? You need the structure in order to figure out what's gonna be the right mutation. And then you need the structure again to see whether you got it right. And here on the right-hand side, uh, you see that uh, with a couple of substitutions, you get a spike protein that all by itself always adopts the correct prefusion confirmation. That's the one that's in the vaccines that are keeping people alive today. So uh, I think it's very interesting that this, these photos were done in, these images were done in 2017, you know, long before SARS-CoV-2. And uh, when SARS-CoV-2 came out, it was just a few weeks before people had the structures they needed in order to uh, make the useful vaccine. Just a few weeks. And you may be saying to yourself, wait a minute, it takes years to crystallize a new protein. And you need x-ray crystallography to get the structure. What's going on here? This is not x-ray crystallography. This is something else. This is cryoelectron microscopy. Maybe we should learn something about it. Okay, and uh, while we're at it, you know, the whole point of this exercise is to get at the conformational heterogeneity, which you can't see in x-ray crystallography. If you had a heterogeneous sample, then uh, either you just see the majority or you don't see anything at all. So this is an important technique. Have I got your attention? Okay, uh, if I've got your attention, then let me digress a little bit. You know, those of you who have studied Russian novels know that there's this concept of the holy fool in Russian novels, okay? Someone who's always asking very naive questions, makes the sophisticated people roll their eyes, and then something terrible happens to him and that's the end of the novel. So this is my job, okay? <laughs> this is my job, you know? We have to ask, as scientists, we're constantly faced with big complicated things that are very important, so we have to study them because they're important, but there's so much technical detail, you could never show that to a student. And um, I'm always asking, is there really something beautiful and simple hidden deep inside that that's actually playing an important role? And if so, I want to show that to a student. Uh, and often the answer is no. You know, and then all we can do is say, well, Smith did this and Jones did that. But once in a while, you get something with something simple and beautiful inside it. And I can say to students, you personally can do this yourself simulate making this discovery yourself, and uh, that's good. And why do I want it to be beautiful? Who cares about beauty? Well, to a scientist, beautiful means unexpectedly broadly applicable. Has other applications that'll help you out in the future if you understand this one, and that's what I want students to get. So let's think about that. We gotta start thinking by, by thinking about conditional probability. Conditional probability, it tells us what you can get, what you can conclude from data. And we do live in a world with uh, boatloads of data, of course, but conditional probability is not hardwired into human intuition, and that makes it difficult. I mean, there's a whole category of lawyers whose job is to confuse juries on the subject of conditional probability. So we need to systematize it. We've got a tool that I want to 
remind you about called the base formula. So if I stood here and I said to you, yeah, all men are mortal, Socrates is mortal, therefore Socrates is a man, you'd immediately pelt me with, you know, tomatoes. You'd say, that's ridiculous, that's stupid. Here, I'll make a Venn diagram. Socrates might be a cat. I, I even know a cat named Socrates, okay? So it's very easy to spot errors of inference in classical logic. But if I were to say to you, 92.7% of all men are mortal, suddenly, boom, all of your intuition goes out the window. You're not sure, it's really confusing, very tricky. We need some way to be more sure-footed about things like that. Now, I don't want to talk to you about Socrates. I want to talk to you about uh, biophysics. And so here's a question with a lot of words in it, but inside this question, there are three numbers. There's some cohort of people, there's some illness, there's some given fraction of those people that have the illness. It's three tenths of 1% in this example. That's one number. There's a test. It's not a perfect test. It makes some false positives. It makes some false negatives. There are rates at which you get false positives and false negatives. Those are other things. Those are the three numbers that are relevant to this question, none of which are interesting to me if I'm a patient. If I'm a patient, my doctor says, yeah, your test came out positive. I don't want to know any of those numbers. I want to know, am I sick? Okay, it's a well-posed question, and I, I refer you to this book. I really love this book by Gerd Geigerwenzer. I, I, I recommend it to everybody. And he just made this a, as a quiz. He gave it to a bunch of practicing physicians with a lot of experience and said, what do you think? And he made a histogram of their answers, and as you can see, they're all over the place. So we can get into the psychology of why different physicians came up with different answers, but they go from nearly zero to nearly 100%. But uh, they can't all be right, right? This is a well-posed question. So how are we going to work this out in a way that is convincing? Well, I've taken a unit square here and I divide it into four subsets. And the area of each one is the probability that we got from those numbers. What I want to know if I got a positive test result is what fraction of all the red area consists of sick people? Okay. I don't care at all about the unshaded area. Those are the people who got a negative test result. I'm not one of those people. I want to know what fraction of the red area consists of sick people. That's the conditional probability that I'm sick, given that I had a positive test result. Okay. Unfortunately, that wasn't given to us. We were given other numbers, like this probability of a positive test result given that you're sick. Okay, that has an area interpretation as well. It's what fraction of the green region here contains sick people. It's just not the same thing. Okay, these two quantities, they have the same numerator, but different denominators, so okay. I can just do a little algebra. I can clear out the bad denominator and put in the desired denominator, and that'll convert the thing that I've been given to the thing that I want to know. So it's totally trivial, right? It's just algebra. But you can't say that to a doctor, right? The, the, that won't convince them. You'll have to, you have to name after some dead white guy. So we're going to call this the uh, Bayes formula and give each of these factors their names. On the far right, you've got the probability that you're sick just knowing nothing about the test. I'm going to call that the prior estimate of the probability. On the far left, I've got the probability that you're sick given some new information, which is the test result. I call that the posterior estimate. And joining them, there's this new factor called the likelihood and a normalization factor in the denominator. So all I've done in the yellow box is what was above it. I just gave things names. So let me say it again in words. Okay, here's, uh, here's Newton sitting on the shoulders of... Uh, Galileo, we're sitting on the shoulders of Pierre Laplace, who was the first person to write down the so-called Bayes formula. The probability that some proposition X is true in the light of new data is the probability that the data you did observe would have been observed in a world where X is true, that's the likelihood factor, times the prior probability divided by a normalization factor. Okay. So it's no exaggeration to say that everything we do with data, all this curve fitting, everything are instances of this base formula. What's it say for our problem? Uh, the thing you want to know on the left is the thing you were given, that 50% on the right times this correction factor. Is it a big deal? You stick in the numbers, it's a factor of 10. Yes, it's a big deal. It takes that 50% down to 5% in this problem, Getting a positive test result means you only have a 5% chance of being sick. Uh, not any of those other random things that uh, those people just guessed. Okay, so 
that's worth knowing for this application, but it's worth knowing for a lot of applications. It's one of those unexpectedly general things that I was alluding to at the beginning. So let's get on to the main event, since this is only a half hour talk. We can improve noisy images by aligning them and averaging them. I'll tell you about that in a minute. That procedure rests on impeccable probabilistic foundations, but how do you align images at ultra low signal to noise ratio? That's the problem. We need to develop some slightly heavier artillery. We have to solve this inference problem and we're gonna use the Bayes formula for that. So here's a protein structure as it was available in 2011. And uh, well, X-ray, uh, well, um, electron microscopy doesn't have the same atomic level accuracy as X-ray crystallography. And yet, just a few years later, cryo-electron microscopy did have atomic level resolution. There was a revolution in resolution that took place in those few years. And there were many aspects to that, okay? There was some technical, there was, there was a revolution in the detector design, okay? There was a revolution in sample preparation. These are not the things I wanna talk about today. There was a revolution in data science. That's the one I want to talk about today that got us from point A to point B. Uh, so what's the problem? Well, the problem is that real data as they come off the electron microscope have almost no contrast. And it's hardly surprising. One molecule isn't going to do much to a beam of electrons. So what you're seeing in these real images, there's something obscured by a great deal of shot noise in the number of photons, uh, electrons that landed in each pixel of the detector. Even with state-of-the-art detectors, uh, you've still got this terrible signal-to-noise problem. There's something there, if only we could find it. So, okay, you know what to do with, with shot noise, you average, you, know, you average away, you, you kill off shot noise by averaging. We take those images and thousands more like them and average them, and it's completely uninformative. Well, why is it completely uninformative? Well, you've got tens of thousands of proteins that all landed on the EM grid at random orientations, with random shifts, you don't know exactly where in the frame each one is. You average over random orientations and you get something circularly symmetric and that's what you see on the right, which is not informative. Maybe we just need a little better signal to noise. So I made, this is fake data, so I can have whatever signal to noise I want. You can start to see an object there now, but the same problem, you average over it and you, and you get this blob. So we have to think a little harder than that, for sure. And as a physicist, of course, I say, let's start with one dimension. That's physics approach. So I have a little raster image there of some fake data. There are three objects. There's one with hard edges, and there's one with Gaussian edges. And there's one with linear edges. And I you know, represented it as a graph of intensity. That's my truth. And uh, then I'm going to take each of those, take many instances of that, subject each one to a random shift to the left or the right, and also add some Poisson noise to it to get my fake one-dimensional data. So at the bottom, you see the best signal to noise ratio. You can see three objects, but it gets worse and worse as you get towards a more realistic signal to noise ratio. Okay, so that seems like a, a good enough test. And um, if I just average them, well, I get something, but I certainly don't see the shapes of those objects. They all look like, they all look like bumps, okay? So even averaging over thousands of instances just isn't helping. Everything is blurred out by that, those random shifts. So we need some unfair advantage and an unfair advantage that came from physics is what makes us biophysicists. Okay, we, we know is uh, in EM, we have many tens of thousands of identical objects, or if they have multiple conformations, there are only a few conformations. Let's just suppose they're, they're all identical. Uh, each one has been subjected to an unknown rigid, but rigid Euclidean motion, shifts and possible rotations. Each one has been degraded with shot noise and the shot noise is independent from pixel to pixel and from image to image. Okay, that's quite a lot of information that we can use to help ourselves with this, do this inference problem. Why is it so helpful? Well, once again, the rigid motion is global over the entire image. So a little physics is gonna help us out. So first thing we might try is cross-correlation. We'll take each instance of the simulated data, 
cross-correlate it with a guess as to what might be there. I'm going to call that the template. Use that to find the alignment. The cross-correlation function has a peak. Each of these three instances has the peak in a different place. Find out where the peak is, shift that instance of the data to get them into alignment, and only then take the average pixel by pixel, and it helped a lot. Okay, at the best signal to noise ratio, it looks great. At the intermediate signal to noise ratio, it looks sort of great. And then it starts to crap out when you get to a more realistic signal to noise ratio. It's definitely an improvement, but we, we'd like to do better than that. Uh, let's try the same thing in two dimensions. I've got low, medium, and high signal to noise ratio. There's an object, there's some noise. Um, if I just average them, I get something terrible. And as I mentioned earlier, it's worse than that because uh, really in addition to shifts, there are rotations. So uh, I've made fake data with random shifts and random rotations and noise. And then as I mentioned before, of course you get something circularly symmetric. Uh, just averaging isn't the answer, but now we have this idea that would, what to do, how to do better than that. We'll take every possible rotation of each experimental image, cross correlate it with a template, which is our initial guess, and here our template is just something random. It's even in the wrong alphabet, but it doesn't matter. Cross correlate with that, find the best one for each rotation. Among all the rotations, find the one with the highest peak in the cross correlation and say that's the winner. Then unshift and unrotate that instance of the experimental data to align it. That's what's in my um, rightmost column there. Now that all the instances are aligned and when I average them, I get something better than what I had before. Okay, it's excellent for the best signal to noise ratio, but it's still kind of crummy for the uh, lowest signal to noise ratio. And it's, but it's worse than that. It's blurred, but I want to draw your attention to this gigantic artifact, which isn't there in any of the experimental data. Okay, it was there in the template. And this algorithm is trying to shift the noise to make everything look like the template, and it pulls out of pure noise this artifact, which isn't there at all in any of the images. So we definitely don't want that. Okay, so cross correlation, it's better than naive averaging, but it's still not good enough. So let's get back to that unfair advantage. We saw we can pluck information out of the sea of noise. Why did it work that well? Well, it worked that well. Well, no, sorry, I'm going to get to that in a minute, why it worked that well. Uh, our unfair advantage is that, again, each pixel has shot noise that's independent of the other pixels. I realize that uh, there is some electron optics that says that's not quite true. Uh, this is a simplification. Correlation in the pixels can be handled by Fourier methods. I don't want to have time to get into today. Each pixel is pretty much independent of the other pixels. Uh, we're going to assume that that's literally true today. Each image has been rigidly translated and possibly rotated if you're in two dimensions. Why is that so helpful? It gives us a statistical model of the data. Every experimental image is the true image that we're trying to find, shifted by something, maybe rotated as well, and then with additive plus or noise on top of it. When you've got a statistical model based on physical ideas, then you can start inferring the unknown things. So Fred Sigworth's insight was to realize that the alignment of each image is, of course, itself a random variable. You know, the, the Poisson noise is a random variable, but the alignment is also a random variable. It's unknown. We should really be talking about the probability distribution of that shift. Instead of trying to select the best winner and throwing away all other possible shifts, there's a probability distribution. There's one most probable shift, and then there's some other shifts that are somewhat probable. Keep them all. Just make a weighted average of, of them. We don't actually care about the alignment. We have to, it's an unknown variable. It's called an, a nuisance variable. And so, okay, we find the probability distribution of the image and its shifts, and, and the shifts, and then we'll integrate out all the shifts. That's called marginalizing them, uh, leaving what we want, which is a probability distribution for the image itself. So one more time, what we need is the posterior distribution of the true image given the data marginalized over the alignment variables. And we have the technology to figure stuff out like that. Okay, so there's the probability of the true image given the data, that's what we want. It's the probability of the true image given the shifts in the data integrated over all the shifts and rotations. 
That's the marginalizing property. Now we're going to use Bayes' formula. Okay, we're going to say, oh, the probability of the true image given the data is the probability of the data given the true image. That's something we have a handle on times the prior divided by the normalization factor. If we can carry out this thing, then we can optimize it over A, the true image, and find the winner. So is that difficult or is that easy? Well, it's easier than you might have thought. The, each image, each experimental realization is statistically independent of the others. So the probability factorizes into one term for each of those. Each of those factors further factorizes because the statistical noise in each pixel is independent of the others. So for each pixel, you take the difference between the experimental value and the shifted true image under consideration and uh, ask, you know, what's the probability of that difference appearing in a Poisson distribution multiplied by all the pixels. The prior also factorizes because each one has an unknown shift that's independent of the others. And the denominator we don't care about because all we're trying to do is take the argmax, find the, uh, find the image that maximizes this thing. That's a constant. Okay. Uh, you still have to carry out the optimization, but you know this is what data scientists do. They find better and better algorithms for optimizing functions of many variables. Turns out that a primitive algorithm known to antiquity called expectation maximization is quite effective. Um, I took the posterior, I take its derivative, set the derivative equal to zero, that's how you maximize something. And I get some complicated thing involving the um, unknown true image. I set the unknown true image everywhere to be equal to the most recent estimate, except for this one place with a pink arrow on it. Then I solve for what that A is in order to make this whole thing be zero, and that's my new estimate. And then I iterate that. Okay, so I don't want to talk a lot about you know, the ins and outs of optimization. The main thing was to figure out what needed to be optimized. And then there's all sorts of technologies available, for instance, this one. I like this one a lot too, because uh, it, has, it, it makes a lot of sense, the bottom line. The bottom line is, you're, yes, you're averaging over all the experimental images, yes. For each experimental image, you're also averaging over all possible shifts and rotations. That's what the integral is doing, with a weighting factor, depending on how well that shift or rotation matches you up against the previous estimate. Okay, that is the exponential of a uh, cross-correlation function. So there's the cross-correlation, except that we're not just picking out the one shift that optimizes it, we're keeping them all and averaging over them. And when you do that, the answer is your next estimate and you iterate. So I applied all that. I didn't just apply it. I had students do this and they were able to do it uh, to that terrible looking one dimensional data. And after just a few rounds of iteration, uh, even at the lowest signal to noise ratio, I got a much better, cleaner answer. You can start to see that the one on the left has square edges and the one in the middle looks more Gaussian. It's starting to look good. Of course, the acid test is in higher dimensions. So remember how awful those things looked at the lowest signal noise? Look how low that signal to noise ratio is. We're picking out something that is almost perfect. Okay. Not only is it almost perfect, but uh, that terrible, terrible artifact isn't there. That terrible, terrible, I, I did start with the same template as before, but after a few rounds of uh, iteration, that artifact disappeared. Okay. This grew into the Relion algorithm and its successors that we have today. I should stop. Let me summarize. It's bad to naively average over noisy images because you, how do you, are you going to align them? It's better for each noisy experimental image to select the one rigid motion that best aligns it to your guess than average that over experimental images. That was a big improvement, but it wasn't good enough. It's way better for each experimental image Instead of choosing one winner among all the rigid motions, make a probability distribution over all of them, find the appropriate weighted average, then average that over experimental images. But that's the algorithm based on basis formula. So some of these ideas are things that I think physicists would consider as beautiful. Let's not forget what physicists mean by beautiful. Part of the answer is, I think, an idea is beautiful if it's surprising yet 
in retrospect, inevitable. Oh, I should have thought of that. That's part of what physicists mean by beautiful. And the other part is it's simple yet unexpectedly general. And I think uh, optimizing posterior probability uh, meets both of those criteria. It's a general framework for many kinds of scientific inference, including the one that's the basis for the cryo-electron microscopy revolution. So I want to thank you for your attention. Uh, I want to thank these remarkable students. I tried this all on real life students at Woods Hole, and uh, they were able to do the calculations that I showed you today. So that made me happy. Uh, here's some references, and I pasted them into the chat as well. And again, thank you very much.